Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from thousands of successful individuals from around the world. I'm your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm delighted to welcome a very, very accomplished professional from Melbourne, Australia, Tina Johnston. Tina, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ash. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you. Tina is the founder of Global Elder Care. She's also the founder of State Manger, Entrepreneur and Entrepreneur. Uh, so, Tina, before we get into talking global elder care, tell me what got you interested in working for the elderly? So, for me, uh, I was more of a late career blooming. I always loved business and I love growing business, but then I we had my own business for a about seven years and then I was I really wanted to find for that next career segment what am I passionate about so then I volunteered in a residential aged care where I was uh, I was actually assisting my mum for care at the time Mm -hmm. and um, it was really about meeting the elderly people and then we started talking their stories and I just really saw how when you contribute and you help people and you light them up Mm. Um, and in such an unserved sector, our elders need more attention. So mm. this is where I decided I was coming back to Melbourne. I said, right, my next my next 20, my next two decades are going to be dedicated to the elder care sector. Amazing. And what the what drew me is I was always drawn to visionaries or storytellers. And my grandmother always said, you know, she'd be at the bus stop talking to anyone she met, but mm. she'd be like, everyone has a story. And it it's true. Okay. So I guess it's, you know, the the joy of meeting people and of uncovering, you know, what's their story, what lights them up from the inside. And, you know, when you get, once you start talking to someone and you engage their passion, you see that inner light, mm. they just light up. Mm. So if we can do that more for the elderly um, and serve them, that's the, that's what my next chapters are dedicated to. Fantastic. And tell me a little bit about global elder care. What are your uh, objectives and why did you start this? So global elder care was a form, the formation during COVID. Mm-hmm. So it was a combination of the, the sectors unserved, but it's also, we are a grey tsunami or a silver tsunami. It's about to happen. We are growing as an industry and the current providers will not they're not, we're not meeting the current care needs. We've mm. got industry staff shortages, but also technology. Our sector doesn't attract investment or startups like other industry does. Mm. Mm. So I think global elder care, the concept was I've been meeting and Zooming or having video calls mm. with people the last two years mm. in the formulation of putting together a podcast and more of an ambassadors and advocacy mm. within our sector where we can look at different perhaps projects, um, spotlights, um, and being more or less being the vehicle of change, what mm. we need, being the, you know, the change we want to see in the world, Correct. we need to bring change makers together. So mm. global elder care is, um, you know, in a way to try and percolate a movement and, you know, change makers to bring change to the sector. Mm. Amazing. And for my viewers and listeners, uh, Help me understand the difference between senior living, assisted living and old age homes. That's a really interesting question, Ash, because the way our current perceptive is on those that terminology. Mm-hmm. So we say senior living. Really, let's look at, let's flip the narrative. Let's say modern elders. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I'm 47, you know, I'm an ex-gen. We've got our boomers coming through care. If mm-hmm. you're blessed to have good health, you know, you could be in your, you know, your sixties now, but then we've got people in in aged care that are, you know, have complex care needs, and they're mm. boomers, and they're already needing care. Right. So, seeing you, I'd really change that to it's. I like the term modern elder. Mm. So that's really where people we're, we're seniors, we're seniors in society. So we need to respect that. But then, assisted living and independent living. We might, you know, we might sort of have a connection to retirement villages or retirement care, Mm. but it's a level when people have 
you know, they they may need assistance with home care. Mm. They may need a bit of nursing, um, but it's it's assisted. Mm. And then we go into, uh, let's say they're the three pillars. So mm. you've got your modern elder, your assisted living, and then we'll call it, you called it old age care when you, mm. um, you know, mm. your email to me. Mm. But really in Australia, we're, the old nursing home, it's not what it is anymore. Mm. Mm. I mean, it's more of a residential care. So it's 24-7 care. So then the third pillar is 24-7 care. Mm. But in saying that, where I work for my day job mm. with Alady Bowl and Clark, we have beautiful homes. Mm. I mean, these uh, I call them like country clubs, health clubs. You know, you don't need to cook, you don't need to clean. Yeah. So it's a different, all your food, there's chefs. Some people have wine, you know, at lunch and dinner. Um, but once again, there is not a parity. You do mm. have, unfortunately, the affluent homes and mm. we have a range. We have like our classic homes, our middle premium, and then we have our signature homes. Mm. So unfortunately, it is a sort of a, you know, it's, user pays it's you know mm. you pay for what you get to, yep. in terms well of said. here in australia so well said and based on all the work that you are doing what are some of the challenges and uh you know or, or some of the challenges faced by the elderly and what can be done to provide dignity and self-respect to them it's interesting the challenges what i'm finding to now is having people plan for retirement their aged care or their residential care, making choices. And we need to start changing that narrative that we need to start planning it earlier on so we're well informed. Hmm. You know, we've really got the increase of dementia in the West. I'm not sure within India what hmm. the ratio, the numbers are, but a lot of people aren't planning for their final chapters. Correct. So within that, we don't have dignity. We don't have choices. You know, some people are not even doing powers of attorney, you know, for family members, and they're leaving these final decisions to the system or maybe people who aren't best suited for their in right. interests. Right. So I think we need to start having more conversations about our final chapters, mm. even about talking about death. I mean, we look at, you know, Mexico, they have Day of the Day of the Dead, they celebrate their dead. Mm. Whereas in with the West and our cultures, it's almost like a taboo. People don't want to talk about it. Mm. And I see that still with the silent generation, yeah. they don't like talking about it. So I think as a society, we need to flip that narrative, change that storytelling to, you know, have a comfort with, mm. you know, death and our, you know, I think there was a book we leave, the average person lives for 4,000 weeks. Mm. You know, in another book, Moments, um, mm. Extraordinary Moments, we celebrate like, you know, the milestones, the 10th, the 21st birthday, the 30th birthday. Then after that, it's all downhill. We don't yeah. celebrate life. Yeah. So I think it's that honouring the final chapters in mm. on many aspects from that mind, body and soul, you know, aspect that really needs to be changed. Mm. You know, this final chapter, uh, that you've just spoken about, it's so, so powerful and so important. I, I don't think too many cultures in the world uh, celebrate the final chapter or even discuss the final chapter. You know, that's so, so such a powerful statement you made. Thank you. My next question to you is, uh, and I think in Australia, you probably have very good infrastructure for the elderly. But uh, what is happening, and, and we are, and the world, we are aging. We're all getting older. Uh, what are some of the infrastructure requirements that you have in Australia uh, that are so positive uh, that the rest of the world can learn from? So in Australia, we're really fortunate. The government, we have a government-funded system. Mm. So in terms of the current program, we've got a there's three levels of our funding. So we have community-based funding, which is generally by the state government. Then we have home care packages, which is national government, federal. And then we have residential aged care, which is at 24-7 care. So it's, it's set up in a more fairer, um, fairer inf infrastructure is that there are government-supported beds mm. and yet there are private-supported beds. So if you can afford to pay for care, you'll pay for the room in a residential care. Or if you can't afford, there is government-funded beds. And they are there's a proportion of each home that has to have that. So mm. it's quite equitable. It's, you know, when I compare to who I've spoken to globally, it is quite a good system. Mm. The biggest market growth is happening in the home care. Mm. People want to stay home. And that's 
you know, uh, that's people's choice. But then it make, comes to a time when they can't stay home. If they're too assist, they're non-ambulant, they need to be in care because their loved ones can no longer provide that care. Mm. Or that home care, that the funds aren't enough, there's not enough money to be able to facilitate that. Mm. So within the home, the biggest growth growth segment is a home care. And we've got a four-level package, home care package, which starts at 8,000, mm. level two is 15,000, level three is 33,000, and level four is 53,000. Mm. So you can see someone who has high care, 50,000 a year that is government funded to them to mm. provide their care needs. Wow. So it's pretty amazing when, when I've spoken to other countries. Um, our, we are really fortunate in Australia. Mm. But, you know, one of the things that I've often, and I've spoken to several people in, uh, you know, who are working in elder care around the world, one of the challenges that I find people face, and I'm sure you face it, is how do you get young people to commit to serving the elderly like you have done? It's really, it's really interesting because it's a sector that it's highly female dominated. Mm -hmm. As carers, naturally, you know, personal care work tends to be more women. Mm. But also, this is the biggest contentious issue in Australia as well. It's underpaid. You know, you can, if you work in retail, mm. you can work in a shop and get paid the same as what you would in aged care. Correct. Residential care or home Correct. care. Mm. So here you are, it's even the same rate as a cleaner. So here mm. you are looking after a beautiful human being, mm. and yet you get paid the same as someone cleaning a warehouse mm. it just doesn't make sense so i think it's really we need to have more um change within you know and change within the rates and valuing care workers and if we do that we also need to have like career pathways for the younger entrants mm. because at the moment there's no career pathways for them it's either you're a nurse or you're the personal care worker, mm -hmm. we need to really open up the structures and make this more of a um, a business proposal for people to have better careers within the mm -hmm. industry mm -hmm. and make it more um, and it, perhaps financially beneficial at many levels as well. That, that needs to be looked at. Well the other thing that uh, Athena and I have seen with a lot of older people is that mental health, uh, and all the other related neurological uh, challenges is becoming a serious issue. Um, how can some of these elder care uh, facilities tackle a lot of these, uh, you know, neurological or brain related problems or challenges? It's a really hard one because there's not enough funding. The new funding model really focuses on mobility, yet mental health mm. is such, that's another underserved area yeah. I think that needs to be looked at. And this is where I think it's bringing key elements like intergenerational mm. programs, ending lonely. There are projects ending loneliness and with Bolton Clark, we have a research arm. Mm. It's bringing in other projects and um interactions and also as is that mental health i think mm. we need to open up more opportunity there because it, it's it, look it, it's a gap honestly ash it's it's a gap mm. at the moment so that's an area we definitely need to build on yeah the other factor that i'd love to get your perspective on is loneliness and isolation which is something which is very serious amongst the elderly more so because family support has reduced dramatically how are you coping with this it's interesting because the generations like, you know, even my generation now, they're often caught, they, they call it the sandwich generation. They're looking after their family, yet they're trying to look after their elders. So as you said, they're not having as much contact. Mm. Uh, isolation is huge mm. in elder care. Even if it, even in the home care, they're home alone. They Most of the time, you know, family or their friends have passed away, their partner's passed away. Imagine you, you've had a partner for 60 years, they're not there anymore. Mm. There's the emotional need. So that loneliness and isolation is huge. Mm. But once again, there are projects that are looking into that. At Bolton Clark, we have programs where some one's nominated you nominate half an hour of your week where you are you're actually given a person to contact mm -hmm. um and so i think we need to be more creative and co-design mm -hmm. programs and interactions and it's more about community we mm -hmm. need to 
we need to have more community interactions with home care and residential care providers. There's a little bit there, but I think we can raise a bar. Mm. And I think this is avenues where opportunity and also introduce technology into this as well. It's not just the human contact. I mean, I was on the phone this morning with um, with a founder for robotics in aged care and, mm. you know, what we can do for the emotional. There's so many elements where a robot, Abby, can come in and, you know, serve the, you know, serve elements in aged care. But mm. these are all trials happening at the moment. So the future space is exciting too. So, yeah, yeah. there's this opportunity. But, but do talk to me a little bit more about how technology is being used to protect and uh, secure the elderly. So when it comes to, for example, devices at home, there's sensor technology. So if just say, you know, the grandma lived alone, home alone, and she got up during the night and, you know, she went to the bathroom, but the sensor a half hour later, she didn't come back. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, then the, the app will actually let the family know that she hasn't left the bathroom. There's a you know, warning sign. So mm -hmm. tech, there's so many enabling technologies from sensors to watches, necklaces. Mm -hmm. So technology wearables, mm -hmm. but then I think we also will be introducing, you know, communicative, communicative technology mm -hmm. um, platforms, mm -hmm. um, things like Alexa for home communications. Mm -hmm. So technology it's like watch this space what is going to be evolving in the next five to ten years i think will be phenomenal mm. and with, i mean with the age tech um communications and startup community there's a lot of exciting things happening so mm. it's will be building on that so I, I really do think enabling technology will transform the sector but we're still we're still lagging behind. We're not mm. fast enough. Mm. Where other industries have got greater funding, mm. they excel. They have that accelerator, but it's we're still we're still at a snail pace. Mm. The other thing that uh, seems to have impacted the elderly was the pandemic, because mm. that seemed to have exacerbated the loneliness part. Yeah, I'd love to get your thoughts on how did uh, a lot of your elderly manage the you know isolation during the pandemic i think witnessing that it was a real you know from an employee in aged care to seeing you know even the residents you know being confined to their rooms even in home care the visitors having people come in or you know with your ppe i think it's had significant impact um but and it's slowly you see the personalities and people coming back with that interaction mm. um but it's still within aged care that it's it's you know 60 percent of people in residential care have a diagnosis of dementia mm. you know and within that the depression statistics and even depression in um, home care mm. i think this is where we need to delve more into these solutions and that mental health it's underserved you know, not enough data is there. And I think by using technology and telehealth, I think this is where new channels have, a, you know, that borderless health concept. Mm. There is sort of, it's sort of percolating. Mm. But, you know, this is where so many new sort of startups and industries are going to intersect. Mm. And I believe help with it. It's just going to take time. Mm. Interesting. And based on all your discussions with so many uh, elderly on a more positive note, what are the elderly looking for? I really think it's that connection, engagement. Mm. And a lot of the time, you know, it's, you know, we've got a certain limited amount of funding, but this is where I, I see, you know, I, I see a vision where we have more, you know, volunteers coming to residential care, you know, even people who are semi-retired, you know, bring, bringing more time into that community mm -hmm. and making a more making more of an effort for that intergenerational and spending time with the elderly, whether at home care, whether it with residential care. So that's where I see a real positive impact. It's connection, mm -hmm. you know, whether, be it technology or in person. It's just making people smile, getting people talking, telling their story. Uh, you know, working on 
on that, you know, working on people's legacies, yep. you know, what, what's important to you? Tell us about your life. What were your lessons? Yeah. How can we then share that with a younger generation? Mm-hmm. Have that two way f- that in- I think that intergenerational is really going to be the secret source of that happiness and engagement. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, given the fact that lifespans are increasing, um, and I've often said that, you know, we're reaching a stage where our life post superannuation or retirement will be almost equal to our working life. Um, How are the elderly coping uh, from a financial perspective? It's interesting. Well, in Australia, the 55 plus women is the highest segment of uh, homeless women. Mm. So these women divorced, they don't, you know, have that income. They looked after the families. So government funding, the cost of living, retirement, it's tough for a lot of people. If they're not planned for that, you know, retirement, if you're if you're fortunate enough to have, you know, planned successfully for your retirement, mm. you were really lucky. You're fortunate. Mm. But for people who haven't, this is where, you know, the retirement age, people need to keep working. Okay. So this is where we, that ageing, we need to we need to change our workforce to also open up opportunities. Mm. You know, if someone was a cleaner, they can't be a cleaner in their 60s and 70s. Mm. What sort of, you know, role shifting or even if it's service, serving the community, yeah. how do we look at an ageing, you know, ageing community and what employment opportunities will we create? Mm. You know, more mentors. This is, you know, you've got corporate people who can have amazing mentorship, mm. ensuring, I think, was it the, with Robert De Niro, the intern, when Robert De Niro then becomes a mentor yeah. in the internship. So yeah. I think, we once again, we need to flip the narrative in this sector. Mm. Very interesting. So I've time for just one more question, and this is for the many, many people who will listen to our conversation. Based on all your amazing uh, understanding of the elders and, all, and your own journey, what would you say are three lessons you would want our viewers and listeners to take away? Oh, it's interesting. I thought about that when you asked the question. For me, from a you know leadership point of view and also with people, I think the greatest thing for me the last few years is observing people who are introverts and extroverts. Mm-hmm interaction with people when you're bringing people together Mm. being mindful that you know you want to have the introverts talking and engaging because being an extrovert it's so easy to take over Mm. the power so Mm. when we're working with people leading people to start looking at the personality traits I'm an ambivert I'm an introvert and I'm an extrovert so (laughs) I've got best of both worlds but others that's been the biggest lesson for me Mm. um, in the last few years Mm. um Number two would be listening, mm-hmm. really listening, not only hearing, but listening from the heart, that mm-hmm. head to heart. Mm-hmm. I think when we pause mm-hmm. and we listen to people on a deeper level, Correct. it's so powerful. Mm-hmm. Really, you know, that mind, body and spirit connection. And a part of that listening is that, you know, turning that person's inner light on. Mm. And I say that from a client perspective and mm. also employees or if it's, you know, it's taking people on a journey with you. Yeah. You know, the third one is in order to be a leader, you also need to be a follower. Mm. I have so much to learn. The more you learn, the more you know, you don't know. <laughs> but they're my three takeaways for today, Ash. Mm, fantastic. And on that note, uh, Athena, and your three amazing lessons when you're with are introverts and extroverts, engage the introverts more, Um, be an active listener. It's very important to be able to put the inner light on of people who are are speaking to you. And the third one is um, about leadership. Uh, But you can be a good leader only if you're a good follower. Thank you so much for speaking to me about your journey, about global elder care. Thank you for speaking to me about so many different aspects of elder care. Thank you again and good luck to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. 
just search for the brand called you